Then, as you said, in 1936, we see um, the left win elections. And you mentioned the Popular Front. And I was wondering if you could just inform people on what the Popular Front was and all of the groups that were included in that Popular Front that won in 1936. So the Popular Front was a ele- left-wing electoral coalition, which included um, the, the major groups that we're going rep- to refer to later in the episode. So there was the Spanish Socialist Workers' Party, generally referred to as the Socialist Party, largely a social democratic party, but it did have a kind of revolutionary faction, which became more so as the war continued. And that party was linked to the UGT Union. Then there was the uh, Communist Party, the PCE, which was the uh, official Communist Party linked to the Communist International. So essentially, you know, uh, run from Moscow. The, The PCE was active in all of Spain apart from Catalonia, where in Catalonia it was called the PSUC, um, which is a kind of communist Catalan nationalist party. Party, and then there was the um, the the group called the PUM, which was a, essentially a non-Stalinist Marxist party that was quite small. Yeah. Um, and then there were um, some left-wing, some left-wing Republican groups and Catalan nationalists in the Popular Front. Also kind of related to the Popular Front uh, was the CNT, the Anarchist Trade Union, which was the largest union at that time, which typically always advocated abstention in elections. But in this election, they did not advocate abstention as an organization. Kind of lots of individuals and groups within it did, but the main part of the union dropped their advocacy of abstention because the Popular Front had said they would release all of the CNT prisoners, political prisoners. So those are the main kind of groups in the Popular Front. The so-called, I mean, they were called the Republican government and under the Republican umbrella, I don't know if this falls in the Popular Front or is just Popular Front adjacent, but wasn't the Republicans mostly just sort of like liberals, progressive liberals? Yeah, with the in the Socialist Party, um, a lot and the left wing Republican groups, you could most of them you could have with that sort of label. Yes. Okay. okay. And then Poem, uh, you said it was a non-Stalinist Marxist party. Is it fair to yeah. call it Trotskyist, or was it? It would be better to call it a left communist party, kind of broader than Trotskyism. Yeah, a lot of people refer to it as Trotskyist, but it wasn't. Neither is it specifically left communist, because left communist has got a particular tradition with times of like the Dutch and German kind of extra parliamentary left. So, I mean, I'd just call it either a Marxist party or a non-Stalinist Marxist party or something like that. Okay, it's cool. So we see the Popular Front, the Republican government won in 1936, runs the gamut from basically liberals all the way to communist and anarchist. Anarchists were hesitant to join electoral politics whatsoever, but because it promised the release of their comrades in prisons who were political prisoners from the more reactionary regime that came before it, they did sort of join forces with the broader popular front in support of that election. What were some major groups and individuals on the right wing side during this time? On the other side, and um, broadly, they're referred to as the nationalists. Now, they included and the most important group, um, the kind of amusingly named but not amusing group, Falange, um, who were the fascist party uh, of which Franco was a part. It also included the CEDA, who were, who were right-wing Catholics, basically, and broadly there were two rival groups of monarchists, and the Carlists and the Alphonsists. As the war went on, all, all of those groups merged into the Falange, which uh, then became the only legal party in Spain after the Civil War, up until Franco's death. Yeah, and I think we're going to get into it a little bit later, but one of the advantages that they were able to do on the right that the left wasn't able to do was to cohere into one big party, i.e. the nationalists, and on the left there was, to a larger extent, more infighting, which we'll get to in a bit. So we have the the players, we have the long history, we have tumultuous times leading up to the 1936 election. In 1936, on May Day, there was this huge showing of radicals all across the spectrum taking to the streets. It scared the hell out of the right, but the right was also coalescing its forces kind of in the lead up to this conflict. But what was it that ultimately sparked the right wing military coup that, that began the Civil War? Yeah, basically the coup was was an open secret. 
everyone knew it was going to happen. You know, the, the, the CNT sort of in his newspapers, you know, they were talking about the coup that was planned and preparing their response. You know, people did ask the Republic to arm the workers, but uh, the Republic refused, um, you know, which is something similar governments have, have also done uh, subsequently to their own to their own detriment so yeah it was an open secret it was going to happen essentially because the the you know the right believed that there was this judeo bolshevik conspiracy to turn spain communist and uh, uh, and also you know the, the the struggles that were going on against employers and landowners the Republic wasn't being brutal enough in repressing these struggles. Um, so, you know, the, for, for the right and for the rich um, in, in Spain, something had to change. The specific thing which triggered um, the coup when it happened was uh, a few events in, in, in mid-July. So on the 12th of July, socialist police officer, quite a rare, quite a rare animal. <laughs> right. um, but uh, essentially the, the Republicans had set up a, a, a policing body called the Assault Guards, as a kind of rival to the hardline conservative civil guards. So uh, an officer in the assault guard called Jose Castillo, he was assassinated by four phalangists. Uh, the following day, on the 13th, a group of assault guards assassinated a right-wing opposition leader, Jose Calvo Sotelo. Um, he'd been a, a minister in um, the Primo de Rivera dictatorship before. So this assassination of this politician triggered the actual start of of the coup so franco was flown general franco um, who became leader of the nationalists was flown from the canary islands to morocco to take charge of the army of africa and uh, launch the military rebellion right so just to put some historical um, numbers on this we are coming up on the 82nd year anniversary of the civil war's beginning because it was in july of 36 and you mentioned the parallels of other you know governments that didn't arm the people when when push was coming to shove and we did an episode relatively recently on chile and allende and pinochet and that same sort of pattern played out where the left had the government they were trying to go about it in a democratic way um the fascist right came together with the bourgeoisie the landlords etc teamed up staged a coup there was like a, re a refusal to arm the people because they were trying to abide by democratic norms and that proved fatal both in chile and as we'll see it ultimately proved fatal among many other variables um, here in Spain but as fighting broke out and this was in a lot of ways the first war the first conflict the first battle the real full-on battle of World War II and it although World War II hadn't officially started yet this was sort of a, a prelogue to that so as the fighting broke out countries across the world took notice how did other countries get involved which countries took the sides uh, the side of the fascist and which countries backed up the left-wing forces the way that the Spanish Civil War is normally spoken about is, um, especially sort of in the, in the media and things like that, is as a conflict between democracy and fascism, much the way that World War II is, is promoted. So <laughs> you, you would expect then that the democratic countries would have backed the democratic republic mm -hmm. um, and that the fascist countries would back the fascists. Uh, and while the latter is true, the former most definitely is not. So when when the conflict started, most countries, including the European democracies, signed a non-intervention agreement where they would basically be neutral in the conflict and blockade Spain. So not allow uh, weapons or anything to get into Spain. Things like uh, the UK and France were, were part of that. Now, fascist Italy and Nazi Germany completely ignored this blockade and they supplied planes, heavy weaponry, troops, um, and the Portuguese dictatorship provided semi-official support and 20,000 volunteer troops to the nationalists. Whereas on the other side, the democracies ignored the fact that the um, non-intervention agreement was completely ignored by the pro-fascist, you know, by the fascist countries and kept up the blockade on their side. So effectively, they starved the Republic of arms and were effectively backing the fascists. I think things that's worth remembering at this time were in the British ruling class, many people actively you know, supported fascism as a bulwark against communism. Um, even like the British Labour Party was split, um, the, the Catholic element in it supported the fascists yeah. um, and supported the, the blockade of Spain. 
and a faction within the Labour Party that supported the Republic got expelled from the Labour Party. Although later on in the conflict, some elements of the Labour Party did voice, did start voicing some support for the Republic. France at that time was ruled by the Popular Front um, uh, under Leon Blum. So this was an alliance of socialist and communist parties. So you would have thought that at least they would, you know, support the Republic. While they did sign the non-intervention agreement, covertly they provided a small number of aircraft to the Republic along with some pilots and engineers, but it was very small support and effectively they, they kept up the blockade. So the only countries to actively back the Republic were the USSR and Mexico. Um, Mexico provided like um, m- uh, money and some small arms and ammunition. Later, their support was really important because they provided diplomatic and uh, refugee support. So a lot of Spanish refugees ended up in Mexico. Uh, the Soviet Union provided substantial military equipment, not so much as aid, but they sold them. This aid was not exactly unconditional and it was not without strings. Um, so we'll go more into that later. But that's essentially the main elements of, of, of the international response. Absolutely. And I, and I just want to kind of harp on the cowardice and the hypocrisy of the so-called Western democracies, including the U.S., who also took a non-interventionist stand when th- their big fear was, at least the, their stated big fear, most of them, was that we didn't w- they didn't want to escalate tensions and, and create World War II. But the irony of it is, is that they did create World War II, and by not helping the left-wing forces of democracy in Spain, they actually, you know, lent Spain to the fascist who would later come back and bite them in the ass. So the cowardice of liberal democracies can't be overstated here. It's really gross. I know France was kind of trying, but when England refused to to help and, and wanted to stay neutral in the conflict, France more or less had to because they, they didn't want to be the only one being targeted by the fascists, etc. Um, but the USSR, and, and we'll get into more some of the nuances in that because the USSR wasn't exactly quick. To, to, to give aid and they weren't um, they didn't stick around all the way to the very very end but when they did support the Spanish uh, you know leftist forces there was a, a for a brief moment a real sense of of love and international solidarity and and I remember watching a documentary which we're going to play clips in throughout the show of Soviet planes coming overhead and, and the people anarchists leftists of all stripes were kind of expecting these planes to be fascist planes but when they realized that they were Soviet planes Planes and some of the Soviet planes were shooting down nationalist planes. There was this big uproar of, of just sort of solidarity all across the left for a beautiful brief moment. <laughs> 